Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alaykum to anyone who may be tuning into this short video. And welcome also to anyone who may be passing by. And today I'm going to be just reflecting again upon Islam in the day and age that we are living in. Uh, what are the characteristics of the day and age that we are living in? And what does Islam mean in relation to that? And I will be referring to this book that I brought out, She Spirituality for the 21st Century, which is a collection of 20 lectures that I've given over the last 10 years and two academic articles as well. And if you would like to order it, there is a link below this video where you can do that. So one thing that struck me when I came into Islam was the perception of Islam as something that is medieval and outdated and how there has been this mentality for the last 150 years that mankind is progressing rapidly with technological development and that other societies, not just Muslim societies, but other non-industrialized societies are falling behind and they have to catch up. This has been the mantra and the way of thinking that has been hammered home in the 20th century particularly and continues to be so today. So when I came into Islam, someone said to me that Islam is a third world religion because it's associated with what people in the Western Hemisphere think of as the third world, i.e. Middle East and Africa, although having been there I've never really thought of it as being the third world so to speak. Uh, when I go somewhere I appreciate the beauty of a place and there is certainly much profound beauty in those regions in comparison to what we see in the Western Hemisphere. I'm talking about like the beauty of the landscape, the beauty of the architecture, um, the traces that are left of the culture from the past, as well as the natural beauty, the trees, um, the nature. Those regions are very rich and uh, very revitalizing something that the Western Hemisphere has lost, particularly in its construction of a type of modern architecture that, in my view, sort of induces feelings of depression. That's another video that I would like to cover, is the issue of how our countries look today in terms of their architecture. I was sitting waiting to catch a flight in a particular airport and to advertise a particular airline there was a video of different cities that that airline traveled to. So I was showing the different cities around the world, Chicago, New York, Toronto, Montreal, some Latin American cities as well, and some European cities. And what struck me when I saw these images of all these cities is they all look the same. And I smiled to myself because I thought, do you realize that you're trying to impress your audience by showing a picture of Chicago and now you're showing a picture of Montreal and now you're showing a picture of Kansas, say, and they all uniformly look the same. They all uniformly have the same high rises and featureless high rises. So what is so impressive about that? Uh, Having spent some time in Turkey in the last few months, I realized that out of the traditional areas of cities such as Istanbul and Konya, the rest of Turkey is quite shocking to see, literally just uniformly 
consists of blocks, featureless tower blocks. I know they have a housing problem there, but I do wonder, like given their pride in their Ottoman history and the way that the Ottomans preserved the beauty of architecture, I do wonder whose decision it was to make 80-90% of Turkey just all look the same. Uh, so people outside Turkey who might not have ever been there have this idea that it still consists of these beautiful mosques and gardens and bazaars and you can get all the traditional uh, tespis there, you know, the prayer beads and the prayer mats and the calligraphy. But that is just in areas that have been preserved for financial reasons. So I have heard in the past that these mosques and the traditional areas of Turkey have been maintained purely for touristic purposes. And that is more or less the case. You do, of course, get uh, Turks going in the mosques to pray. So it's nice that they are being used. But these particular areas have been preserved for economic reasons. And once you move out of these areas, then it just consists of featureless tower blocks and featureless shopping malls with all the same shopping chains that everyone is going to. So it really makes you wonder where is human culture going? Where is human sensibility going? Where is human spiritual consciousness going as well? And does modernity have to look like this? Some people criticize those who like certain aspects of traditional culture because they say they can't handle modernity, like they're so weak um, and pathetic that they can't handle modernity. I don't think that's the case. What it is, is that many people can't handle the ugliness of modernity and the crassness of modernity. If modernity was beautiful, and appealed to the spiritual dimensions of the human being, then modernity, modernity would be a nice thing. It would be a beautiful thing. But I don't understand why modern culture has to also be so deathly. Like, why does it have to be a death blow to our humanity, to the human spirit? This is what I don't understand and I really wonder about the thinking that's uh, gone into this. Uh, Marshall Berman has discussed a little bit about modern architecture in his book All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, a very good book, I haven't read all of it up to now, but uh, he addresses this issue of modern architecture and the effect that it has on the human mentality. So I'm just going to make this a short recording uh, today and I'll just read a little bit from my book where I say that the European concept of progress with the idea that mankind is moving ever forward, developing and advancing, began with Europe importing goods such as gunpowder, sugar and paper from China. That's a nod to Martin Bernal in his Afroasiatic roots of classical civilization. Thank you, Martin Bernal. And ironically from the Muslim world. The modern world began to develop with the expansion of cities improve and improved communications. It developed with alchemists such as Paracelsus taking a more empirical and systematic approach to the practice of medicine and gradually moved into the 17th and 18th centuries with the revival of pure rationalism and the increasing doubt that we can ever really know the unseen, thinking in Europe gradually detached itself from intuitive apprehension. Thinking in Europe gradually detached itself from intuitive apprehension. Separated the speculative aspect of the human being's intellect from the deeper intuitive aspect. The speculative aspect of the human being's intellect, speculation, reflecting as in calculating in a rational sense, separated from our intuitive aspect. 
Man begins to attempt to understand himself by focusing on the physical world and exploring how he relates to his immediate environment. The connection to the one subtle transcendent reality fades into the background of daily life. As Henri Corbin says, the more we are immersed in the things of this world, the more the things that relate to celestial light appear to us paradoxically like darkness and emptiness. The more we are immersed in the things of this world, the more the things that relate to celestial light appear to us paradoxically like darkness and emptiness. The more you immerse your consciousness into this material level of existence, the more you can't see the reality of the celestial levels of existence. And that's just a few thoughts for today. I hope that you enjoyed this short video and inshallah I'll be uploading another one soon. Assalamu